Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, uh, Dr. Manushir Skandari Pajar, uh, who we have had the honor of just publishing his uh, book that you can see. Uh, which I'm starting backwards rather than forwards, sorry. Uh, which is for sale today, and I think the author would sign this. Uh, and then uh, we will have a reception uh, when we get to speak with him. Uh, this is the end of the uh, supposed talk, but now let me introduce uh, the person who has written this book and uh, who is the owner of a number of amazing photographs from the Bajar period, which you will be able to see in the lobby uh, during the uh, reception. So let me begin. Uh, Dr. Manusheh Maximilian Eskandari Tajar uh, was born in Vienna, Austria, uh, of a Persian father and an Austrian mother. Uh, the first 20 years of his life were spent in Austria and Iran, and I know that he partly lived, of course, in Beirut in Lebanon. Uh, and uh, he was educated at French Lycée of Vienna and the French Lycée of Tehran, as we say, what is he, so what is he. And then he received his baccalaureate in philosophy and French literature in Vienna in 1975. And then he went on to study political science and international law at the University of Vienna with an ultimate goal of a career in international law and diplomacy, which he wanted to be a diplomat. Uh, in 1980, while working on his dissertation on the politics of oil in Persia, he was accepted to Cambridge University, Downing College, to continue his studies in international law, but instead took a Fulbright scholarship to study at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Uh, and while at UCSB, he changed his emphasis from international relations to political theory and extended his stay to earn a doctorate in the field. And in a way, he has, I think, stayed ever since uh, and has been a professor uh, at Santa Barbara City College since 1992, a full professor and a force there uh, in terms of teaching international relations, political science, but of course, really hitting the Middle East, I think, section of Middle East studies uh, in Santa Barbara while he was uh, there. Uh, as you can see from, of course, his uh, last name, uh, 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 Dr. Skanderi Hajjo is a member of the Hajjo royal family, and uh, his uh, interest then is beyond, I would say, certainly, simply the uh, intellectual curiosity, which he does have and publishes, but of course he has an emotional, I think, attachment that actually brings about this wonderful photo exhibition uh, that he has had or knows. And so we're able to really sort of capture the essence of some of these ideas. And uh, as someone who teaches here, I really think we have to rethink Iranian history and the way it's been taught to us. Uh, whether in Iran uh, or mostly in Iran, where each dynasty attempts to really uh, upscale the one before it and try to show its achievement through putting down or reducing the achievement of the previous dynasty. So I think a, a fresh look outside of really maybe Iran itself, homeland, is really a healthy way to look at history and come to peace especially for us Iranians, many of us, uh, with our past. Uh, having said that, I ask you to speak, to be seen, and be seen. Thank you very much, uh, President Ayoyi, and um, thank you all for coming. I know you have um, a lot of things to do and that you're taking time off in the afternoon to listen to a lecture here is a uh, a great honor to me. And also thank you to our colleagues here who have been, uh, without them, this would not have been possible. We've been working all day. Um, so thank you again. 
Um, I want to make sure that we have time to see the exhibition next door. And I'm told that in the other classroom, there's going to be a song and dance at 7.10. So um, that is going to be putting literal song and dance, not just, um, so we have to um, hurry up and be done here to then enjoy uh, the exhibition and um, uh, wine and cheese that is offered by the center. Um, as you can see, I chose uh, the title for this uh, talk to be um, to see and be seen, which captures the idea of the Persian kings, Nasiruddin Shah and Muzaffaruddin Shah, and their retinue to come to Europe. Uh, it was a major step. Uh, for Nasruddin Shah to finally decide to leave the country and uh, go on a tour. He did that three times, and his son also following his father, copying his father, did the same. To show the Europeans that he is a peer, and for the European royal houses to accept him, as a peer, which he did very successfully. Um, of course, part of the... Um, um, voyage was also to basically sightsee. And as part of sightseeing, the idea was to be photographed. Um, as you know, Nasuddin Shah was an avid photographer himself. And he established at the Golestan Palace a, um, a studio, uh, an atelier for photography, which was then part of the um, the early polytechnic university um, that was created, the Darul Funun. And he was therefore then eager to go to Europe and see the craft of photography there and the famous photographers of the time. And they were eager to photograph him. Um, the first time that Nasuddin Shah went to Europe, there were throngs of people in the street to see the Shah. It was, it was the most exotic thing they had witnessed. And in every city he would go, uh, the scene was similar. He particularly liked Vienna. And he particularly liked Franz Josef, the emperor. They were almost the same age. They understood each other uh, very well. They had been writing letters and exchanging um, orders and um, writing to each other as my dear brother. So he was particularly eager to be in Vienna, and, and he enjoyed that part of his stay most, as also did Muzaffaruddin Shah later. Um, Austria did not uh, present any threat to Iran. Um, the visit in Austria was um, basically um, an attempt to find a, an ally, a friend, um, when the Shahs visited London or St. Petersburg, it was a different dynamic altogether. And uh, the more I read about uh, in their diaries as to what they had to say about Vienna, the more I see that for them this was truly an enjoyable part of uh, the voyages. So uh, without further ado, the point of this talk is to, in the first part, to tell you how this book came about that you see here. And the second part is to more or less quickly take you through what you will be seeing next door. So a little bit about the genesis of the book and the reasons for publishing it. I've been working on a rather large project for many years now, Austrians coming to Iran. The first group of Austrians that came, came as instructors to, uh, at the Dar al Funun in, uh, in 1851. Um, and then subsequent, many other Austrians in, in military missions and so on came to Iran. And um, the other part of the book that I'm writing is the Persians who went to Austria in particular. There is no such book in the English language, however, there is a book that has some problems by Helmut Slavi in, in German about the Austrian-Persian uh, relations. So I thought, 
given that my own heritage is, as my mother reminds me, 50% Austrian, um, I wanted to write this book uh, and uh, to have it as a kind of a repository of this interesting dynamic between these two countries. But uh, as I was writing, uh, there was a confluence of a series of events uh, that led me to the publication of this particular book. As I said, I was working on the larger project. And then as I'm working on this project, I also researched photographs of Persians in Austria and Austrians in Persia to illustrate this larger project. And I found access to several archives, two of the collections that uh, gave me access to their photographs, uh, lent me photographs for our exhibition tonight. And as we're going through it, I'm happy to show you uh, those uh, photographs that are on loan. And then as I was writing this book and I'm working on it, I realized that um, the segment on Viennese photographers is now orphaned because the Viennese photographers neither went to Iran, um, nor were the Iranians coming to Vienna. They were simply photographers in Vienna. But I had done so much work on these photographers that I felt it would be a pity to just let this um, fall by the wayside. And so basically this would have been a chapter in, in that book, but I thought it would be uh, nice to have it as, a, as an illustrated book uh, of the kind of work that these people did. Now I want you to understand when we today see Viennese photographers, photography has had its day. But when you said Viennese photographers in the 1860s, 70s, and 80s, these were the superstars of the age. Um, um, you probably would be hard pressed, to, unless you're uh, students of photography. <laughs> we have some, some uh, old stars here, but um, unless you're students of photography, you would be hard pressed to mention any photographers, um, even today. Any Leibovitz might come to mind. Um, but when you spoke of photographers in the 19th century, Vienna and Paris were the two centers, Nadal in Paris and the people that I'm introducing to you. So I want you to understand these were not just some <laughs> random people who had ateliers that, uh, you know, uh, visitors went to and had their photographs taken. People were lining up to be photographed by these photographers. So I didn't want this to fall by the wayside. And as I said, then there was no full length study of uh, the background of these photographers and their Persian sitters, uh, which is what this book is about. And then as I'm working on this, um, going back and forth between Santa Barbara and Vienna, uh, a group of colleagues uh, alerted me that um, uh, the archivist of the National Library of Vienna, uh, Michaela Hundner, just published a book on um, the main photographer, Ludwig Angerer, obviously she has access to all the photographs and obviously as a Viennese it was time. But it's interesting now that suddenly there is this interest in these photographers again. For the longest time this was all dormant. So maybe I had something to do with bringing the interest back. Mm -hmm. And then in May of 23, uh, Pfundner writes an article about Bertha von Suttner uh, she was a pacifist and wrote a, um, a novel about uh, that arms should fall silent. And uh, she is the first woman, Austrian woman, who received the Nobel Peace Prize in 1905. Unrelated to anything I'm doing, uh, because I was looking at what Fundner has been doing, I come across this article that she is writing about this woman. And in the article, she has this photograph of of her on the 1,000 uh, shilling banknote. But in the article, Fundner puts this, has also this photograph in her article. She does not identify the princess who are in it, but of course she identifies correctly, Muzaffar Din Shah. And the reason she has this picture in there is because Bertha von Suttner was photographed by Mertens and Co. And in order to show the kind of work that Mertens and Co. were doing, she also adds this photograph, which up to that time, very few people had seen it, was buried in the archives of the Austrian National Library. 
then, as I see this, that this is happening in May, I uh, fortuitously was in Vienna in September, and I went to the archives to see what else they have. And lo and behold, there was a mother load of photographs there, most of them mislabeled. Um, it's, it's hard for you to read all um, uh, German script. But these are the sons of Atterbach, um, the prime minister of, of Nasruddin Shah and Muzaffaruddin Shah. It says here, these are the brothers of the Shah. Um, so most of these uh, photographs, some of them were simply just put there. I mean, uh, distinguishably, that is Muzaffaruddin Shah there, but the rest of them were, were unknown characters. Um, most of these pictures were simply mislabeled, and also no one had ever looked at them. The, the archivists were quite surprised, happily surprised that somebody was interested and asked them to go and look at these things. So I took that as a um, as an incentive. And then in May of uh, 24, I was able to go to Paris. Uh, the Orsay Museum had a had an exhibit on, on the 150th anniversary of the Impressionists. And Parisians do this very well, and the Orsay certainly does it very well. They had a virtual walkthrough through the Atelier of Nadar. It was a 3D. Everybody had these three gla 3D glasses on, and we were basically walking through, being guided by um, various characters. One of the characters was this lady here. Um, guiding us and we had conversations with uh, Monet and all of these impressions. It was quite something. But what interested me was the atelier, Nadar's atelier. And the reason why this interested me was because Nadar was, is one of the figures whose photographs you will see here. Nadar was instrumental in training and in giving the idea to one of the earliest photographers, one of my heroines um, in this book, uh, Juliette Hafner, she had gone to Paris and apprenticed or, or certainly met Nadal and saw the ateliers, the, the famous ateliers with the window pane. And she duplicated that in Vienna. In my book, my colleague in Vienna went to the the atelier still exists, at least the, the building still exists, even though the atelier is now gone. And he took a picture of it for this book. Um, Juliette was the first um, person in Vienna to create an atelier along Parisian lines. And this took the Viennese scene by fire. Uh, she's an interesting figure because she becomes completely um, unknown after a few years. To this day, uh, it is hard to find any information about her, even though she was the super pioneer of everything that then um, kind of uh, became um, uh, the tradition in Vienna. Nadal is also very, very important. Nadal, the father, is also very important because Nadal was the one who introduced uh, Abdullah Mirza Rajar to photography, Abdulhamid Zorajo was sent to Paris by his cousin, Adus Mohammad Khan Mayer al um, He funded um, this, uh, this journey. And um, Nadar took Abdullah Mirza under his wing for a while and then sent Abdullah Mirza off to Vienna uh, with a letter of recommendation to his friend Fritz Lukar, who was again one of the giants of photography in Vienna. So for that reason, that walkthrough, I had the occasion basically to be in the 19th century, which as I was talking to Maria, just stepped out. Both, I don't know if you've seen the film Midnight in Paris, any of you? Um, there is a scene where at, at midnight, uh, the, uh, the main character kind of walks through a doorway and, and is in, you know, in, in whatever age he wants to be in basically in the turn of the century Paris. Well, I am all the time in my head. My wife reminds me I need to come back to reality. Most of the time in my head, I'm in 19th century Vienna, just walking around with these people. And, uh, or in 19th century Paris, walking around. And I had the opportunity to literally, with a 3D um, goggle on, walk through Nadal's atelier, which was absolutely fantastic. 
And then, as I said, I came back from Paris and quickly um, decided I need to write this book and finish it. And uh, by happenstance, at a Nuru's concert um, at the Pacific uh, Symphony, we stand, I stand in line, and there is this uh, handsome young man there. And I say, Kurajan Salam, Edith Mubarak. And the next thing I know, we're having a conversation in the atelier, and on release day, we're having a conversation. And Turash says, why don't you publish your book with us? And I was, my reaction was, you publish books? And he said, of course, we do that. So in other words, long story short, here we are. It's a marriage of, of uh, um, minds. And the result is, is this book. Um, this is what the book explores. Uh, these are the various connections that it makes and it includes the various, uh, the main, these main segments. The connection that it makes is how photography came to Vienna and Tehran almost simultaneously. This is really interesting. Tehran was on the, on the forefront of um, interesting photography. It only took a few years longer for the technology to travel from Paris to Tehran. Obviously, it was in Vienna almost immediately because of the proximity, but that it made its way to Tehran and then became basically a matter of interest for the court. Mohammad Cho was interested in it, and Nasuddin Cho took to it um, and became an avid photographer, and then, as I said, created the photography school and so on and so forth. And then all of this prepared Nasuddin Cho for his travel to Europe. In the exhibit, exhibition that I will be able to show you, I obviously do not have some of the major originals. They are in archives and in private hands, and people are very jealous about them. But I have um, copies, printed copies, uh, of one of the first photographs taken of Nasuddin Shah in Iran by the uh, Italian photographer Luigi Montabone. And then I have a few originals of Montabone, uh, by Montabone, of the um, Italian royal family. But what you will see at the bottom of those is that he has the Shiro Horshid on his uh, photographs as an imprint. He called himself the imperial photographer because in Iran he was able to photograph uh, Nasuddin Shah. And then I have a list here of the Viennese photographers who I mentioned in the book. And these are, as I said, the superstars of the age. My two favorite ones are Juliette Hafner and Adele Perlmutter. She um, was such a superstar. She was the first one to, like Cher and Madonna, she, she was only known by her first name, Adele, um, which was very unusual, first of all, that she was a woman. Secondly, that she was Jewish. Both Hafner and Adele were Jewish, but they were integrated into the, um, the society of photographers and that elite society. One of the reasons I'm thinking that Hafner disappears is that she did not make the transition into the upper crust. Um, I'm just speculating. Everybody at this point is speculating. Uh, there is very little known, but Adele, definitely transitioned well. She married a businessman, millionaire, and then became even more famous than she was. Her studio is still, um, you could still see the building. It is in the center of Vienna, right next to the Park Hyatt uh, at the Graben. So if any of you, ne next time when uh, Professor Dario is there and goes to Julius Meinl for a little uh, espresso, you look up, that is where Adele's uh, studio is. Um, and then the Persian uh, sitters, um, it might be a bit uh, surprising that um, Dr. Polak is mentioned as one of the Persian sitters. But Dr. Polak was the first, uh, the Austrian as part of the first group of Austrians who came to Darul Fanon in 1851. And he became the private physician of Nasuddin Shah. He was so enamored with Iran with Persia, that when he went back to Vienna, he was known in Vienna as the Persian Polak. And one of the photo, unfortunately, that photograph, I, the original is in the library and they're not willing to share. But Juliet Hafner photographed him 
and he is in Persian garb with the uh, Shiro Khurshid, uh, Nishan Shiro Khurshid that Nasir Bichok gave him uh, in credit with for his service. And then um, there are a few other photographers here. Ogarezoy um, Abal um, for instance, was the court photographer of Nasuddin Shah. So what we are seeing here is uh, superstar photographers are photographing Iranian superstar photographers. Ogarezoy was already known as a, as a great photographer, but also um, Abdullah Mirza is being photographed by, by Nadar and by all of these people. And, and, this, and of course, Nasuddin Jah, who is himself a photographer, is being photographed by these people. So it's a, it's a real interesting confluence of events. And then, as I said, um, we of course have this, uh, the influence of these Viennese photographers and Vienna in general on Abdullah Mirza and on Antoine Sebrugin. Sebrugin Probably you're familiar with the name. Um, he um, was uh, uh, a Persian by by uh, by choice. He was born in Tehran at the Russian embassy. He's Russian and Georgian, but he, for all practical purposes, um, adopted uh, Persia as his home, and he died in Iran in, in 1933. Unfortunately, many of his photographs, because they were glass plates were destroyed in the uh, Constitutional Revolution in the bombardment and shattered. What was left of it, his daughter donated to various collections. Um, there is a sizable collection in the Gobestan still, and there's a sizable collection of, of glass plates, of photographs at the Smithsonian. Um, and now, so uh, Severogin is also part of this, um, the influence of Vienna that created these photographers. And now just a few words about the exhibition. Um, there's a proverb, um, as you know, Persians are known for their proverbs. And um, I think um, the whole idea of, of me wanting to show you these photographs is for you to, to see them. It is one thing to hear about things, but it is quite another if you're able to see them. And I want you to see these photographs as works of art. Um, the size of the photographs, the, the borders, the imprints of the photographers themselves. Um, as I was uh, putting together this exhibition, the Smithsonian published a, an article which precisely underscores this point, that it is one thing if you hear about or look at reprints, but it is quite another if you see the original. And uh, the, um, the, the photograph that you see here is of a person there taking in um, electrical impulses from their brain as this person is looking at the origin of the mare. And in this case, I hope that you have the same reactions. We're not going to be putting any uh, electrodes to your heads, but I hope that you have the same um, joy in seeing the originals rather than just looking at reprints of them. And so uh, this exhibition, um, as you walk in, we, we numbered the photographs so that you basically have a, an itinerary as you're walking through. As I said, Luigi Montabone um, is at the entrance. And then we go to um, the Nadas, father and son. What is in red uh, means that we have the original. That is, you're looking at the originals. Um, but, as I said, I don't have all the originals. For instance, I don't have Dr. Polak. But I have some portraits by Hafner in my own collection. And I also want you to look at some of the imprints. That is, I sometimes made either show you the actual backs of these photographs, or I've made copies of the backs. They are works of art even on the, on the verso of the photographs. Um, and then, of course, Ludwig and his brother, Victor, um, I was able to get one original um, um, by them of Nasuddin Shaw, and then I have originals of Franz Josef and Empress uh, Elizabeth. Um, I'm sure you've heard of um, Empress Elizabeth as Sisi. Um, she, if you remember Princess Diana, she was 
Princess Diana on steroids. Everybody in Europe wanted to see her. She was considered the most beautiful woman of her age. So uh, she was, but she was very shy in being photographed and she only had herself photographed with her husband once in a photograph that Ludwig Anger took of the entire imperial family. Every other photograph, they're separate. They would come to the atelier separate. Um, it's up to you to think of the reasons why, but she was very finicky. And then of Fritz Luckert, Fritz Luckert is the photographer um, to whom Nada recommended Abdullah Lajar. So when Abdullah Mirza was in Paris, Nada wrote a letter of recommendation to Vienna to Fritz Luckert, who was Nada calls him master of masters. So it's strange to understand the connections that these people have. And in Vienna, Lukart says to Abdullah Rajar, um, there is not really much I can teach you here, but you need to go, if you really want to pick up the art of photography, you need to go to Salzburg. And he sends Abdullah Rajar for three years to, to apprentice and study all aspects of photography, from printing to the, the chemical processes, everything. For three years, he studies at what used to be the premier school of um, the, the, the craft of photography in Salzburg. Then, as I said, Adele, um, unfortunately, again, I do not have originals of Nasreddin Shah by Adele. They are in collections and people are jealous regarding them. But I was able to get from uh, Mansar Shur, who is a very dear friend, and his, his archive absolutely fantastic. I was able to get two photographs by Adele of Avariza Erbal Satane, that is photographer photographing a photographer. And then I uh, myself was able to um, um, gather uh, two of her photographs of uh, Edward, Prince of Wales, before he became uh, King Edward. And you will see those. And then this is the next generation. So we are talking 1870s for the first generation of photographers. And then in the 1880s and 1890s, the second generation and all the way to the turn of the century, the second generation of photographers, um, I've mentioned some of these names. Um, Amir Ali and I have conversations about Pietzner. Pietzner was at, in his time, the most successful photographer in Vienna. He had over 300 employees. He had ateliers in every city you can imagine. He died broke, um, which was the fate of most of the photographers of those days. They overextended. And then when the, the, um, the fashion of going to ateliers and having yourself photographed and paying you know, large sums of money for these portraits passed, they basically ended up uh, broke. The same thing happened to Mertens. Um, Mertens also was a gambler, but then they um, basically died in, in the poverty. The same thing happened to many of the original photographers in France. They died in poverty. So um, if any of you are thinking of a um, career in photography, <coughs> warning. And then uh, lastly, uh, I end the exhibition with um, the Persians who were influenced by um, these photographers, Usma Makan, who went to Europe. Um, there are always these stories that he passed through Vienna. I have not been able to establish this yet, but um, just as an aside, you are familiar probably with the carriage that Nasuddin Shah uh, had, which is still in a collection in Iran, and it was part of the coronation of uh, Muhammad Reza Shah. The, the crown prince was in that carriage uh, uh, in, the, in the procession. That carriage was uh, um, ordered by Dusma Mahan. And as Dusma Mahan was, because he was beyond wealthy, he also, as he is already ordering a carriage, he ordered also one for himself. So there were two carriages in those days. Now, for you to imagine what these carriages meant, imagine a Rolls Royce and a Bentley and all of the most famous cars and, and the uh, 
uh, that you can imagine rolled into one. These things cost basically as much as a country. Um, people only, only the imperial houses could afford to have a special order carriage made. And Usman Mahan ordered two of them in Vienna. So whether he went to Vienna himself, um, I, I'm still researching, but he definitely um, put in the order for Nasruddin Shah. And on the carriage, it says, by order of Usman Mahan, just in case we forget that it was he ordered. And Nasruddin Shah very happily on his second trip in Vienna um, even before the carriage was ready to be delivered, he took a, a joyride. You know. And uh, in case you want to know two <clears throat> posh Iranians uh, in Vienna, um, and you want to speak to them personally, um, here is, uh, well, we were on a European uh, tour, the two of us, and it so happens that uh, Professor um, the IOE is standing next to bicycles with his umbrella, and I couldn't uh, just let this be, so I had to have my picture with an umbrella next to motorcycle. <laughs> and um, lastly, thank you for.